everyone. Welcome back to the Earth on Survival Guide, the podcast for all disciplines, paths, players, and game masters. With your questers, Josh and Dan, I am Dan. I am Josh. And on today's podcast, we will be discussing all things DeJoto. We'll get to that in a minute. So if you have any questions for us about what, what you're going to hear tonight, uh, please drop us a line at edsgpodcast at gmail.com. Anything you want to bring up, Josh? Because we're going to talk today about the Orc Tribe of the Metal Fist. Yeah, I forgot to mention this in our previous episode. If you have been kept up with the feed, you should have seen bonus a episode. special episode yeah. that dropped while we were on hiatus, a bonus <clears throat> episode, which is the character introduction for the actual play podcast that I mentioned I was a part of where we're playing Apocalypse Keys. Ooh. Dan said he listened to it and didn't understand like three quarters of what was being said because he Agreed. didn't really understand the powers of the mechanics Agreed. or anything. <laughs> that entire story arc, that entire first story arc, five episodes, is available through that feed. You're not going to get it here in hours. If you look for the Novel Games podcast, uh, I'm pretty sure it's available now on most platforms where you can find your podcasts. You can go ahead and listen and through the play that takes place during the story episodes, things might make a little bit more sense in terms of the <laughs> things that we talk about in that introduction. Um, so if that is something that is of interest to you, that is available out there. We are probably going to be recording the second story arc here fairly soon, later in November or maybe in, in December. Fair. But yeah, that's something that is uh, that is available for you. I always like listening to Josh. I just happen to listen to Josh like three times more than everybody else does because I edit these podcasts. So I don't think I need to follow. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Go listen to Apocalypse Keys with Josh. Novel podcast. Novel games. Novel games. There's a fantastic, fantastic bit at the end of that story arc that I am really, really happy with. <laughs> I will say no more. You need to go and listen to Josh, it yourself. He's not name dropping me in any And you'll probably go, oh yeah, that's what yeah. he was talking about. I just know you're not name dropping me by any any strict, which is also, by the way, just fine. So anyway, we're going to talk about the Metal Fist tribe of Carafod. In the book itself, uh, either third edition um, redo of Carafod or the first edition Orc Nation of Carafod, they are listed by the size of the tribe. And so the Metal Fist is the biggest tribe. So we're going to start there. Uh, exactly the opposite of how we did horrors, where we started with the little minions first and worked our way up to the big baddies. So this is backwards. Um, yeah. So the chieftain of this tribe is known as Bronze Eyes. We will get to them at the end, just letting you know, setting some things up. Page 65 of this of the first edition book, because that's the one I was going to go with, because uh, I was halfway through reading it and then I realized, yeah. oh, there's a third edition update. I completely spaced it. There is virtually no difference between the first edition and third edition versions because this was a book that was released after oh, right. Prelude to War, which is when third edition is set. So unlike, say, the third edition version of the Thrall book, where it kind of updates things with the changes that happened between the first edition book right. and Prelude to War. So Nedin yeah. is referred to as the king in the third edition book version and kind of does away with some of the stuff and the story hooks that were related to what was going on with Varilus during the first edition pre-Prelude to War yeah, time fair. span. This is set between the Prelude to War and Bar Save at War times. So the third edition book, I'm sure there may be differences. There may be some extra stuff that's included. There may be some stuff that was excised. But broadly speaking, there's not any significant differences that I'm aware of in terms of the way things stand uh, between fair, the two fair, versions fair. of the book. Uh, I loved reading the history of, uh, the, uh, of care. Ulani Oyu. That's a really hard word to say. A lot of vowels in that one, um, because it's a fascinating, like four paragraphs uh, takes up half the page. It's just great. It's just great writing and a great read uh, upon. I'm going to summarize it for you, but the, I'm not going to do nearly as good a job upon exiting care. Olanioyu, uh, with followers who wandered around with her for many, many years. Uh, when she finally got down to like 11 followers only, because everyone else had kind of settled here and there, not quite wandering aimlessly anymore, she kind of had enough. And once upon a time with her 11 followers, arriving in a dwarf village in Thrall, saw some orcs chained uh, by a dwarf who called them bandits and other assorted unkind words and took 
to melting the chief's sword in a hot vat of molten bronze. So she was enraged by this. Her gahad got up and she grabbed the, the, the half melted blade. And as the metal bronze flowed down from the blade, flowed down the blade over the hilt onto her hand, basically scorching everything and absolutely melting her flesh to the sword itself. At that point, she became metal fist. Again, I'm not summarizing this nearly as well as the book does. She therefore gathered her new followers. Well, A, she slaughtered the dwarf because he was being unkind, enslaving other orcs. She gathered new followers at every open care that she went to and slew any more slave keepers that she came across. And the whole story ends with the phrase, uh, never scramble for dwarven coin and never admit defeat. So her tale is fantastic. And this is where the tribe of the Metal Fist begins. Did I miss anything important, Josh? Any thoughts to add? No, no, nothing significant in that. It's a culture hero story. Mm -hmm. It is a legend of here is how we came to be. Something that is not uncommon in Earth Dawn. Yeah, no, this is I, I this is a fantastic folk tale to tell. And the fact that it's metal fist because it was all done in bronze. So that was there. So uh, I opened the show with the whole thing. All things de Joto, the metal fist tribe has this orc, I can't say ritual, but this orc belief in the orcan word dejoto, uh, which does not mean random destruction. This is about teaching lessons to those who've earned enmity of the passions for living unnatural. Passen Kajujwak, which by the way is um, a palindrome, uh, which is all formerly officially known as Erendis by everybody else, but the orc, in, the orc name is Kajujwak, created a natural order. And since Erendis has gone mad, is now Dis, that's where the disorder of this comes comes from. And so the natural order is to live in harmony with Jaspri, not to tame nature, not to subjugate nature. And so the way you live off the land and the way you live with the animals that you commune with is the natural order. And so they take it this the step far enough that you can possibly imagine where building structures that are permanent is not natural. The way of the nomad is more natural to them. Planting straight rows of crops is not natural. If Jasper wanted them in straight rows of crops, Jasper would have laid them in straight rows of crops. This is not how nature works. Nature is not straight lines and not and everything is flowing. Water constantly flows, air constantly moves things like that. And so that they, they view this whole nomadic lifestyle as the proper way to be that Kajujwak laid out for them. Yes. One thing I want to point out, and I don't know if this is later in your notes, but this I find really interesting, the write-up that's in the, yeah. the book here. There is, as we have seen with, most similarly with the Crystal Raiders, that there is a bit of self-justification that is within this philosophy. Oh, yeah. This is the way that things are. And so we follow the natural cycles of nature. We move south when the days get longer and north when the days get shorter. Yep. We work with our mounts. mounts. We do not subjugate train. them. We don't train them. Yeah, we do not we train them. We, we work with them. We are bonded with them. We are unified. We cooperate. <laughs> and, and it is natural that we take what we need, that when we are hungry, we take what is available. And if that happens yes. to be from farmers, well, it sucks to be them. Exactly. Because you know, a, not a lot of right. you call us raiders. Well, yeah, because you are. <laughs> what you call raiding is actually this honorable and noble pursuit of the natural ways of things that have been corrupted by the mad path. Oh, yeah, it's it's fantastic. I love it in terms of honest characterization and world building and so forth, oh, yeah. in the sense that you have this culture that lives a certain way. And so their stories justify things being the way that they are. Oh, the stories that we are doing yes. this because it is the right way to live. Mm -hmm. And if you don't like it, well, that's because you don't see the truth of how noble and wonderful and right it is that this is the way that things are. And if you don't live this way, therefore you are faulty and you deserve 
the rage that we give on you to teach you the lesson to live like we do. Oh yeah, your self just your self justification point is is on is on target. And then on top of that, because this whole essay, this whole section is told from the point of view of Bronze Eyes, the current chieftain oh, yeah. of yeah the Metal Fist. I love that his daughter is the one adding comments at the end. <laughs> it's not actually broken out as a sidebar, but it is a sort of footnote to this from his daughter. Yes. Tresseg, yep. who was like, yeah, there's there's kind of some <laughs> bullshit in this. <laughs> Don't believe him when he says that this is the way that it is. Mm -hmm. She recognizes that there is a certain amount of, of self-serving. Yeah. Again, coming back to this theme that I see quite a bit, whether intentional or not. I talk about this with the elves. We talked yes. about this with Shosara and mm -hmm. Seriatha about how there is a way that things are yeah. and that the people in power tell stories that help justify the way that they mm -hmm. are in order to maintain their positions of authority and power and, and so forth. And there's a recognition here from his daughter that it's like, well, yeah. there's some self-serving BS in here, too. <laughs> If we're hungry, we take from what's available. When the tribes gather, we all compare our treasures and tell tales. And the one who has the most. Mm -hmm. And it's possible that even like if the chief had a bad year that he could leave. But I don't remember <laughs> that ever happening. No, because we're all winners here. Though our clan of the first spire has won as long as I have been alive. <laughs> that is the indication that or a hint, perhaps, that things maybe are not quite as equitable as the tales yes exactly. might indicate exactly however noble or self-reinforcing yes. so they the might way be. of dejoto is essentially showing others the folly of seeing or seeking permanence structures rows of crops you're trying to tame the weather things like that and just you know make everything the same they don't live that way so they don't they don't like it when anybody else lives that way either so they're all about the nomadic and or raiding lifestyle keeping people on their toes and they kind of go from there. Uh, the Code of Dejoto actually has 10 points, one for each to make your fists, hence metal fists. So uh, these are kind of cool and not too long either. Number one, the blood of heroes runs through the metal fist, and in that blood is the true way, and to the true way we owe our loyalty. We stand with our sisters in times of war because we are the one true people. Fair enough. Number two, respect the way of all things below and above you, for the high may crush the low and the low may drive the high. As the universe has its order, so too does the metal fist. Number three, bring challenges before the whole tribe. Killing in quiet is the way of mad passions and horrors. Number four, the survival of all outweighs the survival of one. Therefore, do not question the chief in times of war. Also some self-serving BS right there. <laughs> Number five. <laughs> well, exactly. Achieve yeah, perfection over others. A little bit. But do not let ambition drive you to corruption. Avoid horror, greed, even if, it means, even if it means the death of your whole clan, for that is better than the death of the world. Number. That is a belief that is, I'm sure, strongly informed by the scourge. Yo, absolutely. By the world that people find themselves in. I don't argue that one in any way, shape, or form. Number six. Do not kill the young or those who carry young. Life to be is the most precious life. Number seven. All peoples were created as free as the land, and all remain so. Enslave nothing, neither animal nor plant, nor name giver. Number eight, stay always moving, for without change there is no freedom, and without freedom there is no life. Number nine, do not betray hospitality. Those with whom you share meals are as your brothers, but if you are betrayed, destroy the traitor and all that he values. Start no one's tool. <laughs> Number ten, give metal for metal, coin for coin, and death for death. And all, by the way, who belong to the Metal Fist tribe, all 12 clans, learn these 10 tenets by the age of four. Yeah, I mean, overall, it is a strong cultural philosophy. Yes. There are parts of it that if you think about it too hard, may seem a little bit contradictory yeah. or not, maybe not quite as internally that consistent. Never happens. But respect the way of all things below and above you. And the chief is above you, and therefore you need to respect his yep. position. <laughs> For the high may crush the low, and the low may drive the high. Yeah. The universe has its order, so do we, and this is the way mm -hmm. that it is. You know, then you've got the survival of all outweighs the survival of one. For the continuation yeah. of a culture, 
that is a sensible mm-hmm. sentiment to have if you are trying to avoid the extinction of your culture. The good of the many outweighs the good of the the, of the few or the one. Thank you, Spock. To quote Star Trek. <laughs> But followed by, therefore, do not question the chief in times of war. (laughs) What if the chief is the one who supposedly or apparently may be breaking aspects of this code in some capacity? This is not obviously like a full code of law or anything. No. But what are the justifications? What are the traditions that are in place in the situation where... Perhaps the king or the the chief rather perhaps betrays someone or is exactly. perhaps uh, succumbing to uh, to horror greed. Mm-hmm. We're not looking at and we don't see really in Earth on any kind of perfect or ideal society. Mm-hmm. This is one where the culture has been the culture develops based on the environment. Mm-hmm. And then culture is, in its own way, self-reinforcing once it has kind of established itself. The idea that stay always moving for without change, there is no freedom. Well, the code is the same. Like the Metal Fist as a tribe has not really changed in all that time. (laughs) It seems to perhaps be like it's like the complexities of troll honor. There is a lot of potentially interesting stuff that can be done mm-hmm. with it. Um, and just having it being presented as like, this is the way of our people. The reason that we do not plant and tend crops is because that is enslaving the plants and slavery is wrong. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. I don't know how else you're going to feed your 8,000 strong guess. clan, but or tribe, but yeah. <laughs> We are liberating the plants that you have enslaved. (laughs) Yes. We are liberating the livestock that you keep penned up because freedom is the natural state of all things. Versus I need to count how many heads I have because I, whatever, you know. (laughs) Agriculture and animal husbandry. I hope I'm not coming across as like two, oh, these people suck. No, we're not being flippant. We're just pointing out that that in all societies, in all structures of society, there is some hypocrisy going on, period. It's complex. It's interesting. It's believable. I mean, there's only 10 tenets. That's not too big. I mean, it's not quite like the 10 commandments that everyone is familiar with that they've heard of. Uh, There's a movie about the whole thing. But this is, you know, 10 tenets to live by. If something contradicts the other one, you know, you go ask the chieftain and he's, he's the decidinator because- You know, don't question the king. Well, sometimes you got to question the king. He may not like it, but sometimes you do it. Make sure he's not horror tainted, things like that. So, um, yeah, to to the larger point of we're not going to plant crops because that's what dwarves do. They enslave the crops. They are 8,000 strong currently. So 2,000 do the raiding. The rest are home and support. You know, the elderly who are too um, eld to ride, to raid. And all of course, all the children that they are raising, because orcs breed a lot. They tend to have, I can't say litters, but they, you know, each woman has up to, up to like six, five or six children throughout the course of their lifetime. And so they are making sure that they are replenishing their ranks. Every child learns to fight. Spellcasters are predominantly shamans or elementalists, just for uh, strictures of if you're going to include your orc as part of this tribe who may leave this tribe or as part of your backstory for your character. By the way, as he said, thieves are not allowed. They don't do that. That's uh, one of the tenets in here, which is... It's number not, three. Bring challenges before the whole tribe, killing in quiet. Yeah. Like, it's it's along those yeah, lines. That, that, the whole thing. So it's dishonorable to them to do nothing that's overt. The so And, and as part of the backstory of this as well, just for a visual aid, because I always like to provide visuals for all the, all the things that are written down, and the art in here is all black and white... The leathers that they wear are dyed in the shades of sunrise and or sunset, whether that's yellows or... So reds and yellows and oranges. Yeah, bright things so they can be seen from afar, so everyone knows who they are when they ride down upon you and raid you. So the Metal Fist tribe is the tribe, and they consist of 12 clans, one for each month of the year, and matrimony is outside of that clan for the men, because really trying to uh, avoid incest and things and uh, weird 
birth defects and so forth and so on. So that's only for the men. The women have a different thing about being married outside of their tribe. So the clans are yes. matriarchal yes. in a sense. The women stay with mm -hmm. their clan once they are of that clan and they stay of that clan and, and the men are the ones that go to go to other clans. And what that does is not just a bloodline like avoiding yeah. incest kind of thing because there were 8,000 of them. There are only 12 clans. Each clan has quite yes. a number of members. There is nothing that would really cause problems in, in that sense, as long as you're not like within the same mm -hmm. individual family unit. But the thing that that does is by having the, the men go out and marry into the other clans is it helps reinforce those connections yes. between the clans to keep the tribe as a whole together rather than potentially having divisions that would cause the fracturing Absolutely. of the metal and we'll fist. we'll get to one of those in a minute or so when we talk about the leaders. So all 12 clans are named for the spires of the Tylon Mountains. They're not listed here, so by all means, uh, look those up or figure them out for yourself. As you're writing all these things, go, go to town. Uh, and chieftains of these clans are always adepts, and each has a threaded gauntlet of the metal fist. These are cultural relics, thread items, that no doubt give additional power to those who wield them. Absolutely. And so that's why the chieftains should have them and be the adepts uh, as far as that's concerned. So life as a metal fist raider throughout the lifetime. So infants and toddlers are raised by those who are, as I said, too old to ride. So like grandparents, I guess. Uh, children work with the elders and nursing mothers to gather food while they are learning their 10 tenets. Uh, they're to Johto. Uh, warriors too old to raid are the teachers of the young. They're keep, they keep the boys and the girls separate because hormones kind of get in the way <laughs> at those ages, between age 4 and 14. So they learn horsemanship, swordsmanship, hunting, wrestling, body painting, and metal smithing. They're trying to teach them to be incredibly self-reliant warriors. Uh, and the elderly work with leather or cloth because those are the soft years. Those are the soft materials that they use. So when you are in your training and you are an actual raider, you actually work with metal smithing. So when these children turn 11, they are fostered to a different clan for two years to Josh's point to embrace the other clans um, and keep those relationships bonded as well. And after six months with a mentor of that clan, they go on their first raid. Anything I missed? We continue to get commentary <laughs> from, from Tresig, from, from the daughter in throughout this, where she's like, yeah, the kids are kind of separated from their yeah. parents really early, which I guess is okay. But those tribes that uh, don't practice this, their kids actually tend to not be quite <laughs> such assholes. It's that's close. not exactly how she puts it, but that's the, you know, it yes. makes for sweeter tongues and less death talk <laughs> is, is how she actually puts it. It's true that the mentors do care no, for the children that parent. they mentor, but it's not the same thing. And she mentions that the fostering not only unifies the clans, but it also means that those horny kids are less likely to yes. cause problems within the family. We need them to raid, not to... Yes. So like, right there's an aspect years, of it as well. Teenage mothers in their teenage years, teenage parents, in their teenage years. So yeah. the metal fist claimed the land east of Claw Ridge in Carafad as their own. And again, they're nomadic. So they attend to uh, the clans wander into untamed, unclaimed jungles, unclaimed forests as well, because they're constantly on the move, as they say, and constantly spreading out into other lands as well. So they are ruled currently by bronze eyes and he's ruled for 21 years he's the one who's writing most of this essay it's the longest tenure ever for this clan after his sister died because the sister the uh the normally it's the women that lead yeah the eldest daughter always leads and so when she passed he took over at that point because he was the eldest son at that point and there wasn't there wasn't a daughter to take the place yes so he claims he's never lost a battle and never sustained a serious injury, which is why he gets to lead, aside from being the oldest son. He's an eighth circle cavalryman and an eighth circle beast master. So a force to be reckoned with. And as we've mentioned, Treseg, his daughter, uh, Treseg Heatsky, who has the commentary on his essay, which is hilarious to read, by the way, 
She's the eldest daughter of Bronze Eyes, and so therefore will inherit the leadership of both clans of the Metal Fist and the Broken Fangs because she belongs to the Broken Fangs clan. So when he passes, she will inherit the leadership of both of the clans. And she is a fifth circle cavalryman. And she's married to Tarjack of the Broken Fangs. So this is actually something that was seeded quite a while ago. Mm -hmm. Sort of. It's interesting because Bronze Eyes actually first shows up in the Game Master's book of the Barsave campaign set. Yeah. Where his tribe is actually referred to as the Iron as the Iron Fist, not mm. the Metal Fist. Yeah. But it does talk about his daughter Tresseg causing him more than a few troubles. And it's talking about her being in uh, whispers that she's in love with Tarjak Stormcloud, um, who's the son of the Broken Fang chieftain. Yeah. Bronze Eyes and the Broken Fang chieftain do not get along. They do not no. like each other. Without the tragedy, there's like a little bit of a of almost like a Romeo and Juliet aspect going here where the two the kids same. are like star-crossed lovers. Not quite star-crossed because clearly like Bronze Eyes clearly hasn't disowned his daughter over this he is like she's the oldest daughter and she will take over when i am gone yes. but i suspect that part of her eye rolling and frustration with her father mm -hmm. is one a generational thing but also because she has had more experience like more diversity of experience yeah. in terms of like seeing how others mm -hmm. live so the broken fang are the second largest tribe yes they're next in carafad and so the practice the rivalry continues and it is one of the several intra tribal mm -hmm. dynamics that drives the politics and situation in carafad um we'll talk about this more when we get into sort of carafad yeah. in general but carafad as a very young nation trying to be forged out of a bunch of disparate cultural yeah. groups is having a hard time balancing those rivalries and, and mm -hmm. difficulties. Again, doing a really solid job of presenting the orcs as more than just a monolithic singular Agreed. culture. There's a depth of variety and presence and intention here where we see I mean, similar to the way that we saw with the Crystal yes. Raiders, right? How the different clans have different mm -hmm. backgrounds and philosophies and intentions, and that you've got a very different culture. While they're still recognizably Highland trolls, there's a different culture between the Sky Seekers and yes. the, the Blood Lords. They have very different philosophies, in part because of who's leading them, but also just because of the culture Maintain. that they developed and, yeah. and continue to perpetuate. And it's a similar thing going going on here. The Metal Fist have been granted certain areas, um, and there is a rivalry that is going on. The sort of unstated stuff about, well, Krathis Gron is the leader, and there is some jockeying for position yes. and rivalry between the, the leaders of the various tribes, hoping to... Be the one to Krathis. woo sire her heir, Krathis, to to potentially. I do like the fact that, despite Bronze Eyes being the war chief, the leader of the Metal Fists for mm -hmm. as long as he has been, that he's still ultimately honoring the matriarchal yes. tendencies of the orc raiders, the orc mm -hmm. nomadic tribes and that he has the position because of circumstance but that he is looking at yes. well my daughter you know will lead when i am done as mm -hmm. is just and right clearly he believes that she will rise to the challenge but he is not in any hurry to actually hand over those reins of power just yet well, yeah and and doing it for 21 years if he started when he was 15 you know that means he's what 36 Orcs barely live into their 40s, and he's raiding a lot. So, you know, accidents do happen. But he's very lucky uh, not to have su sustained a severe injuries at the moment. So orcs are not that long-lived. So doing it for 21 years is a testament to how lucky... Like, how hearty and... Yeah. Yeah. His grandchild, Tresic's yes. daughter, he is not <laughs> fond of because she was 
sired by a member of the yeah. Broken Fang tribe. And that's purely just because it's the Broken Fang tribe. And that's pretty much it. Yeah. So. Better that Tresig should have chosen her Thundra Beast to sire the brat, is uh, yeah. his thought. And then she has a very long response to that, which is like, oh, dad, you jackass. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's a lovely, uh, basically the oncoming thought, the sort of seeds that are being laid here mm -hmm. are that these two great tribes, which are rivals. Yeah. Eventually, when Bronze Eyes and whoever the leader of the Broken Fang, mm -hmm. and they finally move on. Now, myself and my partner... The other 10 tribes. Will work to continue like the unification. And then my daughter. Clans. Is the heir for both tribes. And that will. Yeah. Force them to unify mm -hmm. in a way that the dream of Karafad is supposed to be yeah. as it was one people rather than what it currently is, which is a bunch of squabbling tribes kind of playing at being a nation. Mm -hmm. And also her her opinion of. Bronze Eyes talks a good game about, oh, yes, and Krathis came along and we knew that she was and she's like, yeah, they were all drunk. <laughs> talking smack about her and whatnot. She showed up and they were like, oh, well, maybe actually, yeah, we should follow this person. Yeah, that That's she seems idea. to be a lot more of a true believer in the promise of Karafad than. Yeah. Bronze Eyes and sort of that generation of tribal leaders. And she's had to convince them and they've, you know, gone along with it because, you know, Krathis Grind is, is a very powerful. And process. also, I, I like the little dig that she gives him in there. The Reborn Orc Nation needed our guidance and we will be there to <laughs> lead, the, like, like to demonstrate. And Tristar's like, since we are the largest. He was like all on board on that once I told him that the Broken Fang were already there. <laughs> 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 Playing on that rivalry. There's just a lot of like yes. nice characterization. And like we have with the... NPC and leadership write-ups in Crystal Raiders. Again, there's a lot of comparisons mm -hmm. that we're going to see with with that book because they were totally. kind of like developed around the same time. Mm -hmm. A lot of stuff that is laying either laying the groundwork for potential future development or just things that could be used as plot hooks in a game. Absolutely. We're going to see a, a lot more of that as we continue through this book. Yeah, this is rife with just characterization, use for character histories, when and where you're going. Or if you want to throw this tribe at them, go ahead, the Metal Fist tribe. And I need to clear something up. Both Josh and I have used this, these terms interchangeably, and they are not interchangeable. The tribe is the umbrella of 12 clans. And I've screwed right. that up a plenty tonight, just letting everybody know. So... One of those things. But uh, any other thoughts on the Metal Fist tribe? No, I think we may revisit them just in terms of like how they relate to other groups and, and things like that. Yeah. We didn't really talk about it, but there's a little bit of mention about their their capital, which is sort of a tent city. Yeah. You know, we didn't really talk about that at all. I but we get to there when we get to the geography part. So again, this is sort of the, the largest of the tribes that have gone with Krathis to reestablish Karafad. Karafad. Yeah. And we've got a, a really interesting character and that character's daughter with the beginnings and, and the hints of, yeah, things are actually pretty interesting and complex here mm -hmm. and a lot more nuanced than they might at first appear. Exactly. So it's not just uh, orcs, big, tough, dumb. No, that's not how these, that's not how these orcs are. And that's how none of the orcs are going to be in Karafad. So as we explore further, the geography and the other tribes and everything else about how Karafad works and operates, uh, it's going to be a nice, deep, deep dive. So please join us for the rest of these. If you have any questions for us about them, please drop us a line at edsgpodcast at gmail.com. And until next time, yeah, you're DeJoto practice those 10 tenets. Good night, everybody. 